Grace and peace to you in the name of God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in whose spirit we worship this day. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good day to you and welcome to worship here at Zion United Methodist Church on March 29th. We're doing another version of online worship. And today we are blessed by the opportunity to have one of our officers from the conference office, Sydney Owens, be our speaker and offer us a message today. Uh, she offers us a message in the Lenten theme. We also have canceled our Lenten services along with all other activities in the life of the church. And she is going to speak to us for the message today. And she'll be speaking in that Lenten theme about Jesus temp uh, suffering through the temptations in the wilderness. And then she'll also reference an Old Testament scripture in Judges. And both of those will be a part of our readings today. All the other announcements that there are in the life of the church will be listed in a document you can find on the church's website, ZionGordonville.com. Many of you have navigated there to find this sermon. Probably in a link right below this sermon is a, a link for announcements. If you click on that and click to view those announcements, it'll put up, print up in front of you. As well, there is a list of responsive readings and ways that you can participate with us as we lead you in worship on, this, on that same screen. So please click on that, print it out if you'd like, or have it available on your screen as you're watching and listening to the video. We're going to begin with our worship today with Psalm 32 as our scriptural call to worship. Let us prepare our hearts for worship together, even though we're apart in this time. Oh, what joy for those who, whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all the day. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with your songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like the senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. We just read that we should rejoice in the Lord and be glad. And in fact, that's what we're going to do. We're going to sing a song together, something that you may have heard before. It's not in the Methodist hymnal, but it's in the faith we sing. It's called, He Has Made Me Glad, and we're going to sing that together. I'm going to sit in this chair over here and attempt for you to hear me in our voices as I play in guitar. We're going to sing it two times through. The first time, if you don't know it, you'll come to know it, and then we can sing together. Let's lift our voices. I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. And now our Old Testament reading comes to us from the book of Judges, chapters 6 and 7. 
This is a scripture that Sidney Owens, our special speaker, will reference in her sermon. And it's kind of a long story about the person of Gideon. She will address aspects that I don't have in this scripture, uh, but it's a kind of a long story, so I didn't want to just read everything about Gideon. But he is a pretty interesting character, and some wonderful things happen to him. And we join in with this story in verse 11, and then pick up parts and pieces through chapter 7 and verse 22. It says this, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Soon afterward, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east formed an alliance against Israel and crossed the Jordan, camping in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abiezer came to him. So Gideon and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Harad. The armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave. They may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. But the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. In the other group, put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Only 300 of the men drank from their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. The Lord told Gideon, With these 300 men I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. So Gideon collected the provisions and ram's horns of the other warriors and sent them home. But he kept the 300 men with him. The Midianite camp was in the valley just below Gideon. That night, the Lord said, Get up, go down to the Midianite camp, for I have given you victory over them. So Gideon divided the 300 men into three groups and gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. Then he said to them, Keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, do just as I do. As soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns, blow your horns too, all around the entire camp, and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. It was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the 100 men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly they blew horns, blew the ram's horns, and broke their clay jars. Then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held a blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hands. And they all shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each man at his position around the camp. Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled to places far away. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At this time, we're going to have a moment for children's time, which is going to be a special occasion for us because I had gone on Facebook and put some information out there to different people to record a video of your children communicating what they may be afraid of. It's not a big deal. I'm not here to, to make fun of anyone. And 
Some of the things that, are, uh, that you're afraid of are quite touching. Others of them are uh, just very cute. And so I'm going to show you some of their concerns, what they're afraid of, and then we'll talk about that in just a moment. So here are these videos. I'm scared of snakes. I'm scared of spiders and sometimes snakes. Mostly spiders. And that's really it. I'm afraid of my worst nightmare. I'm afraid of buck buck chickens. <laughs> Not really. I'm afraid of snakes. The dinosaur! I'm afraid of the wind, the rain, and being alone. What I'm scared about is coyotes getting at my animals. I'm afraid of storms. So th those are some of the things that our kids are afraid of. And I'm not here to spend too much time on helping you overcome your fears. Honestly, that was a lot of what we talked about in last week's sermon. How God helps us overcome our fears and will give us strength. So if you're really, truly scared of those things, one of the things you can do is, is pray to the Lord about it and trust in Him. As Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek first God's kingdom and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So continue to seek the Lord's face if you're really concerned. But how it deals with Judges chapter 6 and 7 with the story with Gideon, Gideon was afraid. He didn't think he had the ability to do what God wanted him to do. When it comes to all things in life, maybe the best thing to do when you're afraid is to, to pray about it. But if God gives you a job, just like he did with Gideon, even if it seems scary, he said some pretty important things. Gideon didn't think of himself as all that meaningful, and God said, I am sending you. So God saw him as valuable. If God ever gives you a job, it's because he knows you can do it. And he's not just leaving you alone. He also told Gideon, I will be with you. And then before Gideon left to do what God had called him to do, he said, we find out that the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. So your fear is not more important than what God can do through you. So what we can learn from Gideon is that he, he did exactly what God told him to do and the victory that God promised came, even though it was scary to him. It doesn't make any difference what God calls you to do. No matter how scared you may be, he'll give you all the strength you need to get through it. And if it's not about a job he gave you to do, many of your fears are just things that you're scared of in general. You can pray about it as you seek God's kingdom and live in his way and he'll take care of you throughout it all. Let's pray. Almighty God, Almighty God. we thank you for being so big. We thank you for being so big. And we thank you for being close. We thank you for being close. So that you can always be with us. So that you can always be with us. Especially in those times when we're scared. Especially in those times when we're scared. Always go with us. Always go with us with your plans you have for us and we won't need to be scared we thank you and in Jesus name amen thanks kids for all your participation in the videos it was a wonderful time I hope you enjoyed them and now it's time for our New Testament reading it comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4 this is the familiar passage from our Lenten theme of the temptations of Jesus uh, in the wilderness. And uh, we're going to hear these verses again because they are referenced in our video uh, by our special speaker in just a moment. Let's prepare our hearts for the gospel reading. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, He will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say, you must not test the Son, the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, 
You must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away, and the angels came and took care of Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And in response to the hearing of God's word in the gospel lesson, we're going to respond together with the Apostles' Creed, uh, led by another one of our liturgists. And so let us join our voices together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. And now it's time for our special speaker. Uh, Sydney Owens is going to introduce herself, so I won't take too much time to do that, but I pray that it makes a difference in your life and your heart to hear from someone who's bringing to us excellence outside of just uh, preaching and um, spiritual ministry. There is plenty of that in this message, but it's also something very practical. So I might talk to us about that at the end of her lesson and her message for us. I hope you enjoy. Hello, my name is Sydney Owens. Thank you for inviting me to participate in your worship activities in a rather unique way. I bring greetings from the Missouri Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church way up in Columbia. I apologize for not being able to share this message in person as I would normally prefer. We're going to make the most of what we can today, and hopefully I'll get to come down and visit in person when the situation allows. I began my work at the conference about three years ago as the coordinator of Festival of Sharing. It is an ecumenical effort to reduce poverty and hunger. We partner with nearly 30 denominations, and we host seven share fests around the state in the fall. After finishing graduate school last year, I was able to go full-time at the conference office and adopt the title of Community Engagement Specialist. What this means is that beyond festival sharing, I get to live out some of my passions for rural communities, poverty, and health by working with and supporting our rural churches in their ability to do outward ministry in their communities. Rural churches make up the vast majority of the Methodist churches in Missouri. There are different ways you can define or refer to rural as through commuting patterns, population size, population density, and even culture. I recently read a book by Glenn Dahman that uses this definition. Communities of less than 10,000, not close to an urban core, and may or may not express characteristics of a culture that is economically or emotionally connected to the land they live on. You don't have to fit into that box to work with me or use the resources I find, but I think it helps paint a broader picture of the people I feel called to work with. While doing this work, I'm keeping in mind some personal goals that combine both my educational background and my religious background. One, to promote physical, social, and mental well-being of our communities, and two, working alongside churches to establish their purpose or role in their immediate community. As you may have noticed, I use the word alongside. I truly see the work I'm doing as a partnership. I'm looking to rural churches for their experiences and knowledge while trying to identify resources that will be useful in their work. There will likely be other goals or a vision that we establish for the broader conference project, but I hope identifying those personal goals will help you to see why I feel called to do this work and why I'm excited to share this message with you today. In any conversation we have about what project we want to do, activity we want to start, or change we're thinking about making, the idea of outcomes or impacts will come up. What will happen if we choose to do this? Who will we involve and who will receive the benefits? These thoughts will in turn affect what we consider success or successful. The word success has several definitions. One, accomplishments of an aim or purpose. You could say our church set out to raise $200 for a local animal shelter that needed to buy new pet beds. In two weeks, we were able to achieve that goal with the collection of $200.15, an accomplishment of aim or purpose. You might even say an overachievement with that extra 15 cents. Two, a favorable or desired outcome. A young child lost their beloved puppy, Rascal. Their mom put a post on Facebook and people in the community shared it and spread the word until they found the puppy safe and sound. The community wanted to see that child happy and reunited with the puppy, so they did what they could to help. Third, success also means attainment of popularity or profit. 
A young adult boy joins his high school's football team because his best friend insists is the only way to have a true high school experience. Success can be positive and something we celebrate, but it also has the potential to distract us. In the church, we sometimes use numbers to identify our success. How many people are members, actively attending our services or activities, are we meeting our financial goals, and so on. These numbers do have an important place and value in our conversations. They help us to see some of the impact we're having, but they rarely tell the whole story. Numbers should be one of the tools in our toolbox, but not the only thing we rely on. Have you ever tried to unscrew a slotted screw with a Phillips screwdriver? You could maybe wedge it in there a little, but you're going to struggle getting the screw completely out. That's why we need more than one type of screwdriver in our toolbox, just as we need more than one measure of success. When we're, thinking, when we're working on outward ministry in our communities, we want to use more than numbers to measure success or gain approval from others. If we expand our idea of wealth, we can see that our communities have wealth in the form of shared knowledge, social connections, and sometimes in the rural communities, even the passing down of land or equipment. Are we using this idea of wealth to do what God is calling us to do in our communities, or are we doing what we think others think we should be doing? Who are we seeking approval and guidance from? Approval is part of the Lenten theme on the temptations of Jesus. In the book, Building a Discipling Culture, Mike Breen says, The devil took Jesus to the highest point of the temple and invited him to demonstrate his special relationship with God by jumping off expecting God to send angels to catch Jesus. Such a demonstration of the Father's favor would have certainly secured approval of the crowds. But Jesus refused this temptation. He rejected the devil's invitation by telling him that no one should put God to the test. Jesus probably could have increased his popularity with a stunt like that, but that wasn't his purpose. He wasn't seeking the approval of anyone but God. I'm also reminded of another story in the Bible that exemplifies the idea of success in being faithful to God. In chapter 6 of the book of Judges, Gideon is called upon to save the Israelites who had been doing wrong in the eyes of God. The Midianites were capturing the Israelites' crop and causing them to hide out. An angel appeared to Gideon while he was harvesting wheat and hiding from the Midianites. The angel told him that God was sending him to save Israel from the hand of Midian. Gideon doubted himself at first and even tried to test God's calling with fleece. Eventually, he gets to the point of gathering his army of 32,000, which is big, but not as big as the Midianites. God has a series of tests for Gideon and the Israelites to realize God's divine validity, which results in Gideon lessening his army to just 300 men and truly having to rely on God to help him through the situation. Gideon commanded his army of 300 to surround the Midian camp and make lots of noise, blowing their trumpets and shouting, For the Lord and for Gideon. The Midianites heard the commotion and fled. It took some time, but Gideon realized his true calling and that if he trusted God, he could be successful in carrying out his calling. I've been traveling the state talking with pastors, lay leaders, community organizations, and professionals about what's happening in their communities. What awesome resources do they already have access to and what could be a unique opportunity for them to make a presence in their community where there is otherwise no resource. We're thinking about what measure of success will be important in their context and avoid the temptation to seek approval from others over God. Many of our communities are facing similar challenges that fall in these larger categories of transportation, mental health resources, workforce and economic development, and broadband. If you take one of these categories, say mental health resources, the specific issue or challenge may be different depending on what part of the state you're in. One community I spoke with has enough providers in the area, but they have a lot of residents who fall in insurance gaps and thus have trouble affording resources like counseling. Other communities are far from any mental health providers, so their challenge is getting to the resource. What I hope to do through my role is help our churches who are feeling isolated or disconnected recognize that other rural communities may be concerned about the same topic. We can work together to create and share resources that help rural churches feel connected to each other and to the work of the conference. I want to celebrate the work you are already doing and what you may enter into in response to God's calling. Not in terms of numbers, but in terms of what you define as success yourself. There is temptation to do what is going to be the easiest or what will gain approval and popularity from the masses. I challenge you to continuously reflect on God's calling for your church in the immediate community. Are you using your congregation and even your community's wealth to its fullest potential? 
Think about the social connections and the knowledge categories that exist around you. Bring this wealth to the table and let it provide insight to a community-driven solution. Thank you for the ways in which you are learning and growing with God and impacting your community. If you have any further questions or would like information on this work with rural churches, please feel free to reach out to me. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, Sydney's lesson for us today. And she had some information at the end there that said if you had any questions, you can contact her. But I have uh, a request as well. If you are interested in what she had to say, I think that she packed a lot into her, it was less than nine minutes, but she packed a lot in there for us to think about. Might have something to do with our local community and what we can do as a rural church and how we can always pursue God's approval for us. If something sparked in your mind, if you had some way of looking at the world because of what she's had to say, and what we can do as Zion United Methodist Church, I'd be interested in hearing from you. You can respond any number of ways. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you could respond there. If you're watching it on the website, there's a way to respond through that. You could respond to any flock note that I've sent out to uh, the church members uh, and, and give me your thoughts there. Call the office. Uh, if you happen to have my cell phone number, you can leave me a text message or, or leave me a voicemail, but I'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, if there's anything that you are inspired by through Sydney's message for us today. In response to her message, we have an opportunity to give back of our resources to the God of all resources, giving back only a portion of what he has offered to us. And so, since we cannot pass the plate in a situation where anyone would receive it here, we're going to continue to offer the church address, and uh, you can send your checks or drop by um, something, uh, some form of payment if you'd like to continue to give in this time and just make uh, checks payable to Zion United Methodist Church. And as you prepare your hearts to purpose to uh, respond in some way, I also want to take us into a time of prayer. Would you bow your hearts before me, before the Lord, as, and join me in prayer? God, we do thank you for this day. Even though it is awkward for us to be together in worship, together but apart, we thank you for the gift of technology that allows this to be possible. We thank you for those who help make it possible each week. We pray that you would bless us in our different circumstances. We are more able to understand your closeness to us when we gather together and can hear your spirit connecting to us through each other, through times of Sunday school, through times of visiting in the lobby. And we don't have those times right now, Lord. Help us to remember that we don't have to have the routines of everyday church and everyday life for you to hear our prayer. So I pray that we do take a moment, several moments throughout the week, and lift up to you the concerns of our hearts. We don't just need to keep plugging away at the things that are problematic for us and difficult. If we had the answers for ourselves, we wouldn't be in a problem to begin with. So help us to reach up to you and the things that concern us, fears that we have, problems that we come across, the great concern of this coronavirus and all those whose lives are affected and lives will be lost. We pray would you, that you would draw close in comfort to those who lose loved ones in this time. This is a hard time to understand, God. Many of us have suffered through nothing like this ever before. And we don't know what to do. But as we look back in, in our recent history in the country of America, certainly in your history and in your word, there are plenty of times where things have tested people's hearts and people's faith. But you are always faithful. We pray that you would embolden our faith and help us to rest in you, regardless of what our circumstance is. I pray for those who are working from home that they are able to accomplish many things. I pray for those students who are doing school from home that they are able to execute their excellence through digital forms and that they do well. We pray for our teachers who are used to being with students all the time and now they're not there with them and, and it's hard when their life's calling is being interrupted. Give them stamina and strength. There are all kinds of other jobs where life has been interrupted and it's hard to be in contact with your vendors or with your customers. I pray for all of our small businesses that they are able to maintain. I pray that in, in a few short months on the other side of this, we'll see life begin to return to normal. 
There may be some longer standing issues that happen, but we pray that we can remember your promise to us, that you will always be there for us. You will get us through. Time and time again, that has proven true. We pray that that happens again in this situation. Lord, there may be other requests that I'm not aware of, but we're thankful that as we all pray together right now, you can listen to all of our requests at the same time and minister to the point of each need. Help us to connect to each other through you. And because of a service like this, we can remember to reach out and be in contact over the phone or by email. Some way we can, with our ample time, reach out to those who need a touch and at least be a voice and an ear for each other. You created us to be the church, so help us to fill the void of not being able to be in close proximity in a new way. Give us passion and inspire us to do that. We'll be thankful and give you the praise. And as we do, we'll respond to you in the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And in response, would you sing with me the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Hear this benediction now to conclude our services. May the presence of God the Creator give you strength. May the presence of Christ our Redeemer give you peace. And may the presence of the Holy Spirit sustain you with love and comfort, that you may be held blameless before God as you go forth in grace to love God and love others. Amen. See, you, see everyone next week.